Landboards presents Differential Scope Probe Design Part 3. This is Part 3 of our lesson <laughs> on trying to figure out why the differential probe isn't working like we expected it to be. In an attempt to chase down the overshoot problem, I changed the input scaling resistors to match the app note. The overshoot and undershoot were still present. This is a 1 volt, 1 megahertz input and output voltage. This is with an input voltage of 2 volts peak to peak, which is on the output as well, but still ringing. Looking more closely at the ringing, it looks like the frequency is about 45.45 megahertz. And it looks like the rise time is quicker than my scope's ability to pick it out. To try to debug the problem a little farther, we added a BNCT at the signal generator and hooked up the sec second channel here to the scope. The overshoot is much less than it was before, but the ringing looks louder. Here's the original signal. We've disconnected the cable to the scope, but left the T and everything else in place. Here are the two side by side. The left is without the cable and the right is with the cable. That raises an interesting question. Is it the cable or the scope that causes the difference? So we disconnected the cable from the scope. Here it is with the cable attached and the cable removed, attached. Grounding the shield of the cable at the scope had no noticeable effect. So this raises another interesting question. Is it the capacitance of the coax cable that I'm running to my scope from the signal generator? Or is it the reflection up the lines or what is it? So I replaced that coax cable with the scope probe connected in to the second channel. And guess what? The overshoot is back again. So it looks like it's the capacitance. Replacing the output BNC cable with the scope probe shows that the problem is still present. I'm pretty sure at some point you analog whiz kids out there are yelling at me, you idiot, it's something, I don't know what. Here's another data point. The transition time from the signal generator is slower than the transition rise time on the output. For this piece of data, I've swapped the input and output. So the yellow is the input from the signal generator into the card, and the blue is the output to the scope. I uh, grabbed an FFT of both the input and the output. A couple of us spent some time looking over the circuit, and the thought came to us that perhaps the input stage is passing through that signal. That would be the only way a larger scale signal would come through. So we put together a simulation putting a capacitor across the input resistors of only a nanofarad, and we produced the result that looked quite a bit similar to the original signal. Here's the input circuit on the card itself. The two large pins are the screw connector on the top of the card, and C1 and C2 are the input caps. R1 and R2 are the resistors themselves. And the resistors go through a fairly long etch to feed throughs that go to the other side of the card that connect up to the inputs of the op amp. On the top side of the card, those two vias that we saw on the bottom come up here on the left side of the IC that's there, top and bottom edge, and the connector in the middle, J3, is the input terminal block. It might be good to try to get those resistors as close as possible to those pins on the input. Neither of the sides of the card have either power or ground embedded under it. The area is cut back, as you can see. So we took out our handy dandy X-Acto knife and did some trace peeling and cutting and patched the cards, the parts back onto the card directly to the vias or actually to a notch right next to it. And uh, this is what the rework looked like. And here's the output. Much, much, much better. Still some ringing, but much, much better. And this makes some sense. Remember that data sheet for the op amp? The op amp layout shows a ring, a ground ring, placed around that point where the feedback resistor and the input resistor come together. So these two resistors need to be as close as possible to the op amp and well guarded from noise from the surrounding circuitry. This does make pretty good sense intuitively. The output of an op amp has a wide output voltage swing, so it doesn't need protection as much. And the input side is buffered by the resistor. So guarding that point where the input resistor and the feedback resistor come together into the op amp makes good sense. 
So it looks like we're going to have to take another stab at the layout and try to move those resistors closer and band them. Thanks for watching our video and if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.